The election of conservative Giorgia Maloney as Italy's prime minister has sparked a great deal of conversation over the past few days. Dr. Paolo Gerboado tweeted, it's hard to explain a foreign audience uh, what is happening in Italy with Maloney and how this is possible, but it's easier to understand once you consider this. Italy is the Western country that has suffered the most severe and prolonged economic decline over the last decades. Scuola Normale Superiore, Paolo Gerboado is here to break it all down with us. Welcome to the show. Thanks very much. All right, so many people are uh, stuck first and foremost in a struggle over how to really characterize uh, the, the new prime minister. Is she really uh, neo-fascist as she's been described? Is she a fascist fascist as she's been described? Or is a lot of this labeling overblown in your view? Uh, I mean, the fact that they have links with fascism is not just a matter of conspiracy or exaggeration. I mean, they have fielded as candidates uh, one niece and one nephew of Mussolini, one pompously named Caio Giulio Cesare Mussolini. Right? And they say, but no, it's just a surname. How can you say that they are fascists just because of their surname? But obviously, they are feeling those candidates right, to send a message to their core electorate. Hmm. And sure. then, indeed, uh, I mean, now she's tried to kind of rebrand herself as a more like national conservative. That's how they call themselves. right? But if you see it, the, look at the tone and the content of her politics, it's extremely toxic to the point that she managed to scare the audience of the far right Vox party in Spain because of how vicious her rhetoric was. So whatever name we want to use, it is vicious, toxic, far right politics. Well, I watched um, that clip of her speech that was going around on social media the last few days. I think we played some of it on the show. And look, you're, you're the expert. I'm not. I, I don't know anything about Italian um, politics, despite having some Italian heritage. Um, so I, you know, I take your word for it. But when I, I heard her remarks, I listened to them. What I heard sounded fairly standard in terms of the new kind of right consensus on, uh, you know, she mentioned God, you know, God and stronger families, and uh, actually talked about um, sort of economic exploitation, or consumerism. Uh, honestly, it's uh, there. There are left elements of the thing she's saying, although those elements are now the kind of critique of of I don't know modern corporate society is, is part of some elements of the new right, uh, you know, which is a long way of saying I, I don't, uh, I, I probably would disagree with a lot of her policies, but it, it did not sound, uh, it didn't sound fascist and it didn't sound out of, out of character for the, uh, for the kind of new right moment. Now, it, it could very well be the case that that's what she's saying, but, she, you know, she has the, the connections, it seemed fairly clear, and uh, maybe she has some other uh, other agenda. But, but you know, when you hear her, uh, th there's, a, there's a discrepancy, I guess, between you know, the, the kind of very worst things being said about her and, and what I heard in, in those brief remarks. Does that make sense? Yes, but I mean, you know, moralist anti-capitalism was an element of fascism and nazism as well. Uh, it was an anti-capitalism that was very different from the one of socialism and communism, where the point was that they were against capitalism because it was unjust towards workers, while for fascist and Nazi, the problem with capitalism was uh, about uh, dirty money and bankers, right, and uh, identified with Jews, uh, right, so it was <laughs> two very different kinds of, of anti-capitalism there. And, and then, uh, you know, like a rhetoric against LGBT groups, honestly, is the most extreme that there is in Europe. Uh, I don't know what's the situation in the U.S. Uh, but when you talk about LGBT lobbies uh, and whatever uh, conspiracies of bankers, I mean, there's a lot of discourse there that is quite scary. And, and I'm really talking in a European perspective where we have quite a number of far right groups. Um, so but what the problem for me over politics is not much what her cultural policy is, but who she stands to represent in terms of economic interest. She stands on the side of rich Italians. She stands on the sides uh, of entrepreneurs who want to squeeze further and further the already miserly wages of Italian workers. I mean, to me, the cultural discourse is often more of a diversion to achieve these economic goals of making poor Italians even poorer.
Mm, it's very similar mm -hmm. to what uh, left populists are arguing here is, is going on in the United States. You know, part of why I wanted to talk to you today is because you've done a number of compelling uh, threads on Twitter explaining how the economic conditions in Italy led to Maloney's election. Can you help us understand that trajectory? Yes, you need to understand the rise of Meloni in the context of the Italian economy, which has experienced a very prolonged decline. Basically, uh, since the 90s, it has been declining, 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 to a great extent as a result of failed neoliberal policies of privatization. We had a very large state controlled sector with many companies, many large companies, including multinationals in Italy, being owned or part owned by the state. In the 90s, there was this wave of privatization. The idea was that the state economy was inefficient and that we should instead leave it to the market. But actually, no uh, efficient capitalist emerged. And what happened was simply that the jewels of the Italian economy, the best companies, either failed, went bankrupt, or they were purchased by foreign companies. And guess what? Good jobs, good manufacturing jobs, jobs in engineering, jobs in research and development, they disappeared. They were transferred abroad or whatever. They, uh, they, they are not there anymore. So in this situation of growing uh, decline, I mean, of progressive decline and of despair, really, is a perfect condition for this far right nostalgic discourse uh, to emerge and to gain prominence. So the liberals, the neoliberals have actually paved the way for the far right, as it has happened, you know, a century ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you about her, for, um, Georgia Maloney's uh, foreign policy, which I understand I'm learning more about you know, what she stands for. I understand that she is uh, actually very pro-Ukraine in the Ukraine-Russia conflict, um, which in some sense puts her out of sync with some elements of, uh, of you know, what she would describe as, as the far right uh, in, in, in the U.S., frankly, and, uh, and elsewhere. Um, can you talk more about that? Yes, I mean, in her book, in a recent book, she described Putin as a defender of Christianity. She had a similar rhetoric to the one of Salvini, though Salvini was less wise in a sense that he completely jumped on the Putin bandwagon. But when Putin was popular on the right, she was more wise and careful. I mean, you need to give it to her. She is a very intelligent politician, a very cautious politician. Uh, she's uh, actually softer on the EU as well than Salvini's Lega, which is the other <laughs> populist right party. In Italy, we don't have one populist right party. We uh, have two. Uh, and, um, and what would you say? I mean, she's very uh, Atlantist. She's very pro uh, the Atlantic Alliance, very pro NATO, very pro US, very anti-China. And therefore, I mean, she has a very opportunistically changed, in a way, her stance vis-a-vis -vis Russia, uh, seeing this fight uh, uh, in this war in Ukraine as an opportunity to kind of solidify the Atlantic bloc and solidify also the Atlantic bloc, uh, bloc pre um, preparing for a fight against China and against other powers. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think that's a, it's really important to to know, especially because I, I've seen some people on the left even accusing her uh, of um, kind of performatively saying that she p supports Ukraine just because she knows that that's where the, the that that gives her some plausible deniability as a as a anti you know not a full blown <laughs> fascist. And it seems like your your statement there that she has been cautious in picking sides and coming out too strongly for one uh, party or the other uh, is reflective of that that this may or may not be in part at least a strate strategic choice. I mean, I'd say that it is, uh, uh, you know, the, the strength of the right I think in Italy and as elsewhere is its ability to change position tactically according to circumstances, rather than make of every position a matter of principles and a matter of kind of general strategy. And while the left instead is more moralistic, it wants to be right on any issue and therefore it never wants to change position though it may be politically uh, mm. self-defeating. So in this context, clearly, Meloni has picked the, the winning side, what, what looks at least from our perspective now, the winning side. Plus, 
uh, the militarist, uh, the kind of um, arms race that is now uh, developing is also something of interest for some industries that are allied to some of the people behind there. Right? Hmm. Italy has a quite significant weapons and defense industry. And uh, this is clearly a sector that Meloni's yeah. party uh, wants to represent. Hmm. Very interesting. Well, I've got to let you go, but I've, I just wanted to note Hillary Clinton uh, weighed in on Georgia Maloney saying, I don't know much about her, but any time a woman is elected head of state, that is a step forward. <laughs> got to love her. Uh, girl, girl power. <laughs> girl power. Girl boss. <laughs> Paolo, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Cheers. Thanks for inviting me. More rising right after this.